So let's talk a little bit about cardiology. This is gonna be an introduction to cardiology. Now, a lot of students are really terrified of cardiology. I understand, especially for paramedic students, it's a lot of information. Uh, typically, whenever I do cardiology, it's about at least a month worth of material. Let's go ahead and talk about the introduction. Why are we even learning about cardiology? It was originally taught because we are trying to determine how to treat and who to treat when it came to an acute myocardial infarction. Now remember, that just means that we have a narrowing here or complete occlusion of coronary arteries. Could be from atherosclerosis, it could be from plaque buildup, it could be from whatever the case might be, but a heart is actually dying and we need to find out why and how we can fix that and what are the signs and symptoms to catch it early one person has an acute myocardial infarction in the u.s every 40 seconds so just me talking about this intro somebody had a heart attack so i can't start any lecture or any intro to any chapter in paramedic school without going over a little bit of anatomy so let's dive into that Talking about the cardiovascular system, what is it composed of? Heart and blood vessels. Remember, this delivers not just oxygenated blood, okay? Your, your blood carries a lot of other things. Look at this, it delivers chemical messengers known as hormones and also transports waste, okay? If you remember, carbon dioxide is one of those wastes that gets transported throughout your blood and then you breathe it out, which we're gonna get into. I got my superior and inferior vena cava. Now, remember with those vena cavas, that's where deoxygenated blood's gonna be coming into the heart. Now, both of them are gonna come up and dump right here into this right atrium. Now, that's where blood gets introduced to this heart, into that right atrium, and it needs to now go through this tricuspid valve. Now the tricuspid valve is shaped so blood can't be regurgitated or backed up back into circulation. So it's moving in in one direction. And once that blood fills up in the right atrium, dumps through that tricuspid valve, it goes here into my right ventricle. So now that my right ventricle fills up with blood, and it gets pushed through the next semilunar valve, which goes into my pulmonary circulation. Okay, so remember this is still deoxygenated blood. Now this deoxygenated blood goes through now something called the pulmonary artery. Okay, so this pulmonary artery now goes into the right and left I know I just did that backwards. That was the the left and then the right lungs, okay? So goes into those lungs. Remember, this is where this blood actually becomes oxygenated. It's getting oxygenated through diffusion, right? That blood is letting off its carbon dioxide, picking up fresh oxygen, and it's going to be coming back now through pulmonary veins. Where it fills, is in this left atrium. Now we're almost through the entire heart. Now we have rich oxygen blood. It's going to drop through what's known as a mitral valve into our big left ventricle. Now the left ventricle is kind of like the powerhouse of the, of the heart. It's got the thickest muscular walls. And this is where that oxygenated blood gets pushed up and through circulation. Now you see this other semilunar valve. Let me actually get rid of some of this scribble just so we can see it, okay? I got another valve called a uh, aortic valve. That's where this blood now gets transported through into the aorta. Now your aorta is the size of a garden hose, okay? And it allows for a lot of blood and a lot of pressure. And remember, we have two different sides of the heart, not just the left and right side of the heart, but we also have a high pressured side and a low pressured side. This is where highest pressure is found in this left ventricle, putting high pressure into the aorta and pushing all that oxygenated blood into circulation. Now here's exactly what I was just saying. The right heart is the right atrium and the right ventricle. 
known as a low pressured system, known as pulmonary circulation. Remember that right ventricle pushes that blood into the pulmonary artery, right? And then that gets distributed through the lungs. That's known as a low pressured system. The high pressured system is known as the left side, the left atrium and the left ventricle, high pressure due to having to feed systemic circulation. One part of the heart that's very important that you understand is the myocardium, known as the middle layer of the heart wall. This is that thick muscular tissue that's built for contractions, okay? Just like the middle layer of your uh, blood vessels, if you remember, that's built to actually allow your blood vessels to dilate and to constrict, and it's like the muscular fibrous wall. Okay, same thing with your heart. We have a middle layer called the myocardium, and it's built for strength, okay? Contractility. A little bit about coronary arteries. A lot of students ask me, Mike, do I need to memorize what the coronary arteries feed basically on the heart? And the answer is, yeah, you kind of do, okay? On your national registry exam, uh, you will see some sort of questions like this usually. Also, in paramedic school, uh, there's always some sort of question as to what does the left side or left main coronary artery either supply or what does it divide into? Now, let's take a look at the left main coronary artery and what it supplies is the left ventricle, right, and the septum. Left ventricle and the septum. Two things that this left main coronary artery uh, divides into though. We have the, the LAD, left anterior descending, which is basically a descending artery onto the heart. And then the other one is known as the circumflex. Okay, the circumflex. So I remember those. Left main coronary artery divides into the LAD, known as left anterior descending, and also the circumflex. Now the right coronary artery supplies the right atrium, where the SA node is, which we're gonna be getting into conduction. The right ventricle, part of the left ventricle, and then also portions of the conduction system. So the right coronary artery supplies a lot. Now, when it comes to, does the right coronary artery uh, split into multiple different sections of arteries? No, it's just the right coronary artery. Okay, the right coronary artery. We can see that right coronary artery right here where it supplies the heart. We see our LAD, left anterior descend, and over here is our circumflex. Just goes around onto the other side of the heart. So cardiac cells have four properties that help the heart function, and these four properties are something that you need to know. They're kind of like vocabulary words with regards to cardiology, and make note of them. Okay, the first one's automaticity. Remember, this is how the heart can generate its own electrical impulse. Uh, there is no other muscle quite like it. Okay, your heart just makes its own electricity. The shit's magic. Okay, it really is. Excitability, the ease of these cardiac cells to basically talk to each other. Okay. Not only are they talking to each other and are able to work in unison, but understand that they do something called depolarize, okay, which we're going to be talking about with the conduction cycle, but talking about depolarization or this action that occurs within these cardiac cells to create a heartbeat. Okay. Um, but this excitability allows for each one to not only depolarize, but also repolarize to get ready to basically depolarize again. Conductivity, the actual conduction system, okay, which we're gonna be breaking down in pieces of how it works in unison. These cardiac cells basically fire at one location and then go through this conduct conduction system, right, and can create a heart rhythm and then a heartbeat, right? And then contractility, how these cardiac cells can actually cause stroke volume, okay, by allowing that heart to basically contract and expand, okay? These cardiac cells have to work together. And let's get a little bit into how this conduction system actually works. It's based off of six parts, okay? 
SA node, atrioventricular node, known as the AV node, the bundle of his, the right and left bundle branches, and then the Purkinje fibers. So here it is. Now I know in the PowerPoint it said six parts. Remember, right and left bundle branch, those are two parts together. This one has it labeled as one part. So it shows five, but same information. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. If I go ahead and look over here at my SA node, now this is located in my right atrium. Now in the right atrium, this is where electrical impulses start, okay? So this is known as the primary pacemaker of the heart, the primary pacemaker. What that means is electrical impulse starts there, and this is how a heartbeat is made, by the way. It moves on to you know, my AV node. Okay, my AV node is here. Okay, kind of like near the septum of the heart. Now, what this AV node does is it slows that, basically that conduction, or gives it a slight pause to allow for ventricular filling of blood. Now, again, once that sinus atrial node fires, we said that's a primary pacemaker, what happens is the atrium of the heart basically contracts. Whenever I say that there's a depolarization that occurs, I want you to always think something is contracting, right? Something is moving within that heart. So when the SA node contracts, it's the right atrium. Deoxygenated blood gets pushed down, you guessed it, into the right ventricle. Something else that's interesting here, when talking about the SA node, you see this line kind of going all the way over here to the right and left atrium. Understand when that SA node fires, the atrium of the heart contracts. So if there's blood inside of the left atrium, that blood will be ejected down into the ventricles as well. Okay, so it all kind of happens all at one time. And I hope that wasn't confusing. Just remember the SA node contracts, the atrium of the heart contracts, pushing blood down into the ventricles. Again, getting back to the AV node. That impulse that just fired from the SA node travels down into this thing called the AV node, okay? The AV node, remember, there's a pause here. In that pause, blood starts to fill into the ventricles, and then there has to be a depolarization of those ventricles. But there's a pretty long pathway to get all the way down here, right? Pretty long pathway. So. What happens is it has to go down into the bundle of his. Now the bundle of his is this little location here just below the AV node. So that electrical impulse fires down the bundle of his and then it gets branched off into the left and right bundle branch. Okay, so we can go ahead and see, remember with anatomy, everything is like backwards. If I labeled this, this would be the left bundle branch, and this on this side would be my right bundle branch. That impulse fires down, and it goes up into what's known as the Purkinje fibers. Now these Purkinje fibers are located all along this edge of the heart, same on this side. We got different fibers, and that is where our conduction system ends, and by depolarizing or creating an action that goes all the way through those Purkinje fibers, it causes a ventricular contraction. Now, you guessed it, if you know anything about blood flow, once these Purkinje fibers contract or depolarize, it causes a ventricular contraction and that blood gets ejected to its next location. So if we remember, if it was in the right ventricle that's going up into the pulmonary arteries, if it is the left ventricle, it's going up into the aorta and out into systemic circulation. Now there's a lot of different things that can stimulate your heart to either beat harder or to beat faster. Now, there are nerve stimulation, so obviously your brain plays an important role. Same thing with your spinal cord, right? We have a nervous system that can cause what shows in this photo here, pupil dilation, right? When we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, which is going to cause a stimulation in glucose, uh, stimulation in adrenaline, cortisol, all different types of things which 
our stress responses, which is going to increase the not only rate, but also the contractility or the strength of contractions within your heart. Now, let's take a look at something called the parasympathetic nervous system. If you've never heard of this, or maybe it's just a reminder, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous systems are opposites, right? The sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight, which is a kind of like a stress response. Again, causes that pupillary dilation. It's going to cause your heart rate to increase. Now, parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite. It's going to cause you, we call it rest and digest. Okay, slows the rate of discharge of the SA node. So just seeing what this, the parasympathetic is going to do to your heart. Slows the conduction through your AV node weakens the strength of atrial contractions, and then also recall, uh, causes a reduction of force within the, ventri the ventricles as well. So interestingly enough, we can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system by sending messages through a vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve. By promoting a vagal response, we can actually lower heart rates, maybe even heart blood pressures. How do we perform a vagus maneuver? or vagal maneuver, we one of them is known as pressure on the carotid sinus, which typically is not recommended for pre-hospital care because people do it incorrectly. And by putting pressure on somebody's neck, you can actually limit the amount of blood that's going to their head. Um, and you can already see why that would probably be a bad idea. Maybe a better option would be straining against a closed glottis. Okay, all you have to do there is ask the patient to bear down. They strain as if they're, you know, doing a bowel movement or straining the hold their breath and strain. It kind of puts pressure against, again, a closed glottis, and that causes a vagal maneuver as well. Another option is to take a syringe, have the patient blow into the syringe, push really hard into the syringe, trying to push that plunger out. Okay, so a couple different options for performing a vagal maneuver. Now remember, by performing this vagal maneuver, the brain senses that and it tries to slow down the heart rate. Okay, electrical impulses travel to the SA node, causing a release of acetylcholine. This acetylcholine signals the SA node to slow the heart rate. A couple other vocabulary words that you need to know. First one is baroreceptor. Sensors composed of specialized nerve tissue, these detect changes in blood pressure. So let's say that you have a patient that is having a low blood pressure. Now, there is a reflex that your body has, thanks to baroreceptors, that will cause vasoconstriction. It's kind of like a compensatory mechanism to try to increase your blood pressure and vice versa, okay? If your blood pressure is too high, your baroreceptors might gauge this blood pressure being high, so it causes vasodilation to try to decrease that pressure. It says when stimulated, they generate a reflex response in either the sympathetic or parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Next one is chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors detect changes in concentrations of hydrogen ions. Okay, for your pH, oxygen and carbon dioxide within the blood. So your body is constantly measuring, remember, for homeostasis, right? It's just detecting changes in pH to determine acidity or alkalinity, right? And also um, gauging how much oxygen and carbon dioxide is within your blood. So let's go ahead and jump back into electrophysiology and talking about the conduction system depolarization by definition is a muscle fiber when muscle fibers are stimulated to contract that's it all I, I, I whenever i say depolarization i want you to think of like an action happening Depo something's depolarizing and it's creating a spark which is causing contractions Okay, occurs through changes in concentration of electrolytes across these cellular membranes. Okay, what really is happening during depolarization is the cells, the cardiac cells, are permeable. Okay, well, if you remember what permeability, permeability means, it's they allow things in and out of the cell, right? Leaky cells, some way to look at it. 
Um, now there's a couple different ions that get introduced. Okay, the changes the cellular wall changes to allow not only sodium in but also calcium enters the cell. Depolarization spreads, causing mechanical contraction. So contraction of whatever part of the heart is depolarizing at that point. Um, again, sodium, calcium get introduced to the cells, causing this contraction to occur. Now, repolarization. These two terms get kind of thrown around a lot. Repolarization is begins when the closing of sodium and calcium channels. So we just had sodium and calcium enter the cell, which cause a contraction. Now we close off those ions. Sodium ions get pumped out and potassium ions get pumped in to the cell. Now, the one thing that I kind of want you to know or understand at least what, with repolarization is not only just potassium is getting introduced to that cardiac cell, but now that heart is the cells within the heart are getting ready to depolarize again. Okay, so that's basically what repolarization is, is getting those cardiac cells ready to be depolarized again, to create this that never ending cardiac cycle. Right, your heart beats constantly, and this is how it happens. If you wanted to read up on cardiac action potential and really get into the weeds, and you're gonna get some large word like sarcoplasmic reticulum and talking about millivoltage and things of that sort, it's an interesting read, but for most students, I'm gonna be honest with you. You don't, I hate to say that you don't need to know it, but at the same time, I don't think you're really gonna be tested on exactly what's going on in each phase. Um, now, if your instructor is kind of like really into cardiology and really anal about it, I would probably make a note card on each phase and basically just saying what is occurring within each phase. Honestly, if I were to talk about it, I would just be reading off of this PowerPoint and I'm not going to do that to you. So let's move on. Getting back into the conduction system, let's go ahead and take a look at the SA node, known as the sinal atrial node. Specialized conduction tissue propagates electrical impulses to muscular tissue. Now we know which muscular tissue we're talking about, right? We're talking about the atrium. SA nodes located in the right atrium, that's where it's located, okay, the SA node, receives blood from the right coronary artery, and it's the dominant pacemaker. Like we said, this is the primary pacemaker of the heart that, remember, automaticity, where electricity Basically, its conduction occurs or starts is in this SA node. AV node, again, just to uh, recap on it, electrical impulses move from the SA to the AV, impulse conduction is delayed. Remember, this is where it slows down and pauses. Why? To allow for ventricles to fill. Now, the electrical conduction system is pretty interesting because, because I, I, I showed you basically where the SA node was located, where the AV node was located, where these Purkinje fibers are located. But what if, what if your heartbeat originated in a different location than the SA node? Hear me out. What if my electrical impulse, which we all know is supposed to originate here in my SA node, what if it originates here in my AV node, okay? So for whatever reason, my SA node's not working, what would happen if my electrical impulses start at my AV node? Well, what would happen is your heart rate would decrease, okay? Not only would my heart rate decrease, but also my EKG would look a little different. But let's go ahead and take a look back at this PowerPoint that talks about intrinsic rates. So these intrinsic rates are normal rates in which the heart rate will be if electrical conduction occurs at that location. So for the SA node, which is me and you most likely right now, right, is uh, 60 to 100. Normal heart rate for an adult, 60 to 100. Everyone knows that, everyone's heard that before uh, because that's considered normal. If my heart rate starts in my AV junction, my AV node, exactly what I was just showing you in that, in that photo. If it occurred right there in the middle where that AV node is, my heart rate would be between 40 to 60. 
okay? If my heart beat originated within the Purkinje fibers or Purkinje network that is located in my ventricles, my heart rate would be 20 to 40. I would have an extremely slow heartbeat if it originated in my ventricles. If I had some sort of firing that occurred down here, over here, whatever the case might be, it's located in the ventricles, my heartbeat would be very slow. All right, let's talk a little bit about limb leads. Okay, lead one, lead two, lead three, where they're being placed. Remember, this provides detailed information about the heart's conduction system. Now, we just talked about the conduction system starting from the SA node all the way down to Purkinje fibers. How can we monitor how that heart's conduction is actually working is through EKG, okay, or ECG, electrocardiogram. Now, these electrodes are placed in predetermined locations, okay, trying to get out of your way here. Now, the electrodes, white, black, red, green, what I always say is uh, salt, pepper, ketchup, relish. That's usually the easiest one for me. Some people say clouds over grass, smoke over fire. However the hell you want to memorize this, I don't care. Just remember where to place the leads. Now, the other thing that I want to make note is where exactly am I placing these leads? Uh, depending on where you work or depending on where you've gone to either hospital clinicals, maybe ride times, whatever the case might be, you've seen people telling you to put them in different locations. It's okay. Um, you can listen to them. Maybe they like putting their limb leads over here on the abdomen, or the lower abdomen. And these upper leads, limb leads, sometimes on their chest wall instead of their arms. Some people, they say they prefer it on the arms. My biggest thing is make sure that you just do not place these electrodes on solid bone, especially uh, for EMS. You're going to get a lot of artifact. It's going to look a lot like this, what you see on this guy's monitor right here, um, even though that is a dysrhythmia, but it's going to look a little crazy. Okay, so just be mindful of that. We don't want to see um, artifact. It just looks really messy. And if you put it on some parts of the body that have a lot more flesh, we usually get a better reading. Okay, Eindhoven's Triangle. Eindhoven's triangle, negative lead on the right arm, positive lead on the left leg. So you can kind of see that here. We got a negative lead, negative, negative, over here on the right arm. Left leg is a positive, positive. Okay. Now, making sure that we place our leads in the right location is going to give us a proper view of this heart. Eindhoven triangle is basically how limb leads work. Okay. Then we have our uh, negative and positive on left on the left arm. Now you might note, Mike, right leg isn't there. Right leg is known as ground. Okay. So just make sure they're in the right locations for you to get a proper reading. It says shave body hair if necessary. Um, just make sure we got good pad to skin contact, just kind of like with pads for defibrillation. We can't have too much hair in that location. It can't be wet, um, anything of that sort. Now, just show you with Eintoven's triangle exactly what you're looking at. Uh, when we say lead one, attached to the right and left arms is lead one. So you can see this line here going up, uh, across, that's lead one. So if we turn on an EKG and we're looking at a 12 lead, which I'm going to get into, uh, and I'll break down exactly what you're looking at, we can look at each lead, okay? The most popular lead to look at for EKG tracing is lead two, which runs between the right arm and the left leg. So lead two right here. This gives you the best view at a four lead EKG or a three lead EKG. We're looking at lead two. Lead three runs between the left arm and the left leg. Remember leads one through three are considered bipolar leads. All it means is they contain a positive and negative pole, bipolar. 
Again, just reiterating augmented leads, augmented voltage leads are created using four limb electrodes. So again, we have salt, pepper, ketchup, relish on our patient and in between the leads, and you can see where this augmented, um, it's just like an alternative viewpoint that's occurring from those leads uh, is occurring. So we have augmented vector right, which you can see right here, AVR. It, all it is is left arm, left leg, right in the middle of that lead. It's basically pointing at that right arm. We call it augmented vector right. We got augmented vector left. And then we have augmented vector foot, AVR, AVL, and AVF. These are three different leads that are occurring from our limb leads, right? Well, again, we have four limb leads that we attach, one of them being a ground, which is the green, and they create these three new leads. I know this sounds like it's magic, and it sounds like, man, what the hell am I even thinking about? What am I looking at yet? I know we haven't even looked at an EKG. This is kind of breaking down what we are going to be looking at. So again, we have limb leads that are attached to a patient. By attaching those limb leads, I can look at three different views, leads one, two, and three. And by having those limb leads on correctly, I can look at these augmented viewpoints as well. That's all that we've talked about so far with regards to limb leads. Now, if you know anything about placing an EKG on a patient, you should know that we can also do something called a 12 lead EKG. A 12 lead EKG are known as adding precordial leads to your EKG. I know we said 12 and you're saying, well, these precordial leads only have six because right here you see V1 to V6. These are known as vector, vector one to vector six. These are considered unipolar leads. And if you take a look here, this Wilson terminal, it's just this one point on a heart. And there's a reason why the leads have to be placed on exact location uh, to get the viewpoint of the heart. So I think this one's a little bit better down here. You can see the patient's back is over here. Now look at the front part of the patient. We have leads V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. They're all pointed at the heart. That's how the 12 lead EKG works are these precordial leads. Remember the vector one through vector six, they have to be applied to a specific location to look at different parts of the heart. And this is how we get a better reading on exactly what's going on with the heart. So let's quickly look at lead placement for a 12 lead EKG, starting with vector one, fourth intercostal space, or ICS, right, intercostal space, to the right of the sternum. So fourth intercostal space, remember your intercostal space, number one is right underneath your clavicle. So if you feel your clavicle, that first drop off, you're in ICS one, going down to the fourth intercostal space, we're going to be placing our first electrode, first electrode to the right side of the sternum. Because remember the rest of these leads are going to be going across the left side of your patient. Lead V2, again, fourth intercostal space, right opposite of lead V1 or vector one, right? Fourth intercostal space to the left of the sternum. Vector three, directly between leads V2 and V4, which means the next lead after V2 should be lead ve vector four. Take vector four, you're gonna place it in the fifth intercostal space at the left mid clavicular line. So you take the patient's clavicle directly in the middle of their clavicle. You come down to fifth intercostal space. You're going to go ahead and apply that lead. Then you're going to place lead V3 between lead V2 and lead V4. The next lead that you need to do is vector six. Okay. Vector six is at the level of the lead V4. You're going to go mid axillary. Okay, right between their armpit. You're gonna come down, 
again, same level. What level is that? Fifth intercostal space. You're gonna place lead V6. Right between leads V6 and leads V4, you're gonna be placing lead V5. So that is how you put on a 12 lead EKG. Now I know we haven't gone over how to read an EKG and I'm not showing you this just to confuse you. What I am showing you this 12 lead EKG for is to sh basically sum up everything we've talked about so far with regards to limb placement and what these limb leads are looking at. Let's divvy out exactly what we're looking at. Up here, I have lead one. We talked about our three lead EKG. Lead one, lead two, lead three. Okay, All. how do we obtain a three lead EKG? By just applying our limb leads, our four electrodes. Okay, I got lead one, lead two, and lead three on my 12 lead EKG. Now, how this thing looks, and I'm gonna use a smaller line here, is this 12 lead gets kind of split up, right, in different sections. So we got a section there. I got a section over here. And then I my last section is this entire thing right here, which I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Let me just go ahead and darken up this line so you guys can see it a little bit better. So again, I got leads, leads one, two, and lead three. Now, typically when you're looking at an EKG and you turn on a monitor and we have a four lead or a three lead EKG hooked up to our patient, we usually, again, see lead two. Hence why this is very large here. Okay, lead two is typically what we're monitoring uh, when we're looking for somebody's EKG rhythm. Uh, you can set it to look at whatever you want. So in this example that you see on the screen, this person wanted to monitor lead V1 or vector one and vector five for whatever reason, they set that themselves on the monitor. That's not how it originally uh, is going to be popping up on your monitor, but you typically will be seeing lead two, okay? Now, again, our regular limb leads are creating half of our 12 lead EKG. What half are we, am I talking about? From here down, and this side, this is all created by my limb leads. So I get lead one, lead two, lead three, my augmented vector right, augmented vector left, augmented vector foot, remember from Eintoven's triangle, this is what I am seeing from just my limb leads that you're attaching to your patient. Now, if I do perform a 12 lead EKG on my patient, I am then going to be seeing my vector leads, also known as precordial leads. My precordial leads are creating leads V1, which is up here, lead V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Remember, that's applying those 12 lead EKG around my patient's chest, left side of their chest. Once all this is put together, I'm able to print a 12 lead EKG, which is going to give me 12 different views. Even though it's not 12 different electrodes that you're placing on the patient, technically it's 10. We place these 10 electrodes on a patient, but we get 12 separate views from our leads. Hope that made sense.